So just to jump in, um, how many of you guys, when you get to the start of a new year, ask the Lord for a word? Does that resonate with anybody? Am I the only one? Am I just weird? Cool. So that's that's a practice that I have. Uh, I'll... I'm, my my large, meaty fingers are uh, gripping the antenna. <laughs> You're all good. Um, so, at the beginning of every year, I ask the Lord for a word. And when I went and talked to him this year about that, uh, he spoke pretty clearly and he said, it's time to break yokes. He said, it's time to break yokes. And then the flip side of that was, if there's a, a yoke that the enemy would want to put on his people, then there's the yoke of Jesus that we want to put on, right? It talks about in Matthew, Jesus says, Come to me, you who, we, who are weary and heavy laden, and put my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest. And what's really interesting is um, that I got that word at the very beginning of January, and it was only a couple of weeks before I started having people begin to reach out to me for deliverance appointments. Um, so it's one thing when... You know, you get a word and you can sort of like anchor your hope and you're like, yeah, that's great. Like, Lord, you and me are going to do that together. But then all of a sudden it's like, I've got this word. And then all of a sudden stuff starts to unfold in front of me where people are saying, you know, I've got this issue and I really feel like there's something more behind it. I feel like there's something of the enemy at work in my life. And I'd love for you to pray with me to break that off. Uh, and that's really, there's been a lot of that this year. Um, I've been privileged to be a part of a lot of different times to pray for people. And um, just wherever I go, I see the Lord doing that, whether it's me or through other people. There's something that the Lord's doing where he's setting his people free. He's setting his people free. And that's going to be something that I want to talk about today. Um, and I also want to uh, give you guys some context, too, for what I believe the next move of the Holy Spirit is going to be marked by. And I believe it's going to be marked by deliverance. And when I say that, I mean, I'm just going to spell it out very plainly. It's going to be marked by Jesus freeing people from demonic influence. And if you've got theological questions about that, you can talk to me later. I won't be going into all of that right now. Um, but I want to give, I found an interesting stat that I want to just tell you guys again. Um, I want to set sort of a context for why I'm even talking about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, you guys are familiar with TikTok, yeah? I know, I know, we're, the way I talk, there's like a million different left turns, but I promise we're going somewhere. Okay, so we're familiar with TikTok. Stay with me here. How many of you are familiar that uh, witchcraft, Wicca, New Age stuff is very prevalent in our culture today, yeah? So there's actually a, a hashtag uh, within TikTok called Witch Talk. Okay, and I found this really interesting statistic. It's about a year old, but the numbers, I think, just uh, give an interesting snapshot into where our culture's at, specifically where Gen Z is beginning to come from when it talks about spirituality. So as of November 2021, hashtag Witch Talk has 20.7 billion, with a B, views on the app, compared to hashtag Kardashian at 6 billion, and hashtag Love Island, which was a reality thing at the time, uh, at roughly $5 billion. We're not even in the same ballpark as the other ones, right? We're talking tens of thousands of billions. And if you happen to use that app, uh, really all you have to do is when you go into a live where people can... One th it's one thing where people can, you know, make a video, they put it up, but the lives are where people are, like, live streaming something that's happening right now. If you go to that portion of the app and you start scrolling... It won't take you more than a couple minutes until you start running into people doing seances, tarot card readings, crystal balls, all this stuff. Um, and I'm not, I don't say that to stir up fear in you, but I say that to sort of support what I said. If we're believing for a, for a billion soul harvest, if we're believing for a time in history where the Lord's going to be saving more people than ever before, that's going to look like a lot of culture that's gotten wrapped up in the occult, wrapped up in Wicca, wrapped up in witchcraft and all that stuff because they didn't know any better coming into the kingdom. And it would behoove us as the people of God to know what it looks like to bring freedom to those people. 
there's been a point in time in church history where we in the West said, you know, we're too sophisticated for that. I don't know if we believe in that. That seems really, you know, maybe that's something that goes on overseas, but it doesn't happen here. Uh, we are rapidly approaching the point where our ignorance will cost us dearly. Okay? So again, I say this to bring awareness, and I say this to bring actually hope, because if the Lord's going to start talking to us about it, then he's actually giving us a head start. Okay? This is nothing to be scared of. Um, so moving, again, sort of forward. Uh, and again, this promise is all tied together. As I was praying about today um, and praying for the rock, the, the thing that the Lord highlighted very specifically was that I believe the Rock of Roseville is a house that's called to raise up fivefold ministry leaders. Um, we got a few claps because, okay, we can agree on that. We've got the claps for the people who know what that means, and then I've got a bunch of blank stares from people who are like, what are you talking about? So in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul lays out sort of his structure for how the church was set up. You have apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. And these are what we would call fivefold offices. And there are people that the Lord's called to occupy those offices as service to the church, as service to the bride. We move uh, a little bit further on in that part of the text, and it says that they are called to equip the, equip the saints for the work of ministry. So already we've got something generally a little bit backwards where the assumption is the people who are up here are the ones who do ministry and everybody out there are the ones who sit in your chair and receive. That's already a little bit backwards. Um, oh yeah, we're, I'm going to be saying it as it is today. We're just going for it. Um, so what does that practically look like? What does that actually mean? Just to give you a brief rundown. An apostle is somebody who's got vision and who knows really the next steps to take in terms of breaking through and taking ground for the kingdom. It's more than just somebody who has planted a bunch of churches, though that can absolutely be a part of it. Um, then you have a prophet. That's somebody who hears the word of the Lord. Their, the primary function of their gifting is hearing what the Lord is saying and releasing that. They're visionary, but oftentimes what they're hearing is years, months, X amount of time down the road, um, they usually deliver what they're saying with, with a certain sense of urgency because the Lord will give unction and urgency to give them the grace to wait through until the breakthrough comes. You have pastors. These are the, these are the people who you want running a home group. Uh, these are the people who you have, some of you have friends this way. It's like, regardless of how they're doing, they're always checking in on you. They're making sure that you're healthy. They're making sure that you have what you need. And it's more than just this person's a nice person. There's a supernatural grace on their life to actually do that and connect people to the kingdom through that. Then you have evangelists. Again, we're all called to do the work of evangelism, but there are certain people who the Lord's anointed them where it's like they can't go anywhere without people getting saved left and right. Uh, my my brother-in-law, Alex, I would say is one of those people. Um, especially when I first met him, it was like every time I met him, he was like, dude, three people got saved at Whole Foods yesterday. Dude, I went to the mall and this person came up and they were crying and they're like, I need to know Jesus. And he's like, who are you? I don't know, but let's pray to have you accept Jesus. And then you have teachers. These are people, again, we're all called to know the word, but these are people who have been given a grace by the Holy Spirit to study deeply and know line upon line what truth is based off of the word of God. So again, we need all of that. And when I say that the rock is called to raise up fivefold leaders, that's what I'm talking about. That's where we're called to go. That's where the Lord's taking us. So something though, and this is where we start to get into what I want to talk about today. Something we often miss when we talk about the fivefold is we usually stop right at, they're called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The chapter doesn't end there. Moving on from that point, it says we're called to, the, the fivefold office is called to minister, equip the saints for the work of ministry until we all attain unity of the faith and maturity measured by the stature of Christ. So if there's a call to raise fivefold leaders on this house, then there's a call to unity on this house. 
There's a call to unity on this house. Because how many of you would understand by looking at where the world's at, looking at where the church is at, we've got a lot of people who say they've got really powerful ministries, but we have very little unity. And I want to say, I want to preface this too, um, or I should say interject this. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about, you might hear what I'm saying as being degradating towards the church. That's 100% not my heart. That's 100% not what I'm going for. I actually love what Brandon said where he brought up uh, the picture in Revelation where Jesus is walking amongst the lampstands. And why I bring that up is if you look at the context of what's actually being said in those verses, the church is basically in shambles at that point. There's people who have actually let in a Jezebel spirit in some churches uh, beyond just this esoteric weird, like, I don't know, it feels spiritually funky. It's they've actually let in corrupt teaching to where people are committing sexual immorality on a regular basis. There's people whose love is growing cold towards Jesus. They're forgetting the love that they had at first towards the Father. And it's actually in that, and it's actually in that context that he gives John this vision of Jesus walking through the lampstands. And what does that mean and why do I say this? That means that regardless of what the church is going through, Jesus has not given up on her. And I'll say this too, with all the deconstruction and everything that's going on. I'll be gaining it now. I'll be gaining it now. Construction, but you can actually deconstruct and still hold on to Jesus. Um, what I would say with all of that is um, I would acknowledge that the church in general, the church in America, we've got a lot of stuff to work on. But you have permission to give up on the church when Jesus gives up on the church. I'll say that again because some of you got offended, so I'll just say it again. <laughs> you have permission to give up on the church when Jesus gives up on the church. Exactly. And this actually leads into, again, what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the political spirit or the divisive spirit, if I can say it that way. To give a quick little bit of biblical background, um, again, I'm going through a lot, and I realize that. But to give some biblical background for what I mean when I say the political spirit or the divisive spirit, um, because I'm aware that using language like that automatically sort of puts me in this category of like, you know, these frou-frou, esoteric, charismatic people who may not have a lot of grounding in reality or a lot of grounding in scripture. So let me explain to you where I'm coming from. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, I think we have a slide for that. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And I would propose to you that when Paul's writing this, he actually means something. We get very familiar and overly familiar, I would say, with the words of Scripture. So we read that and we're like, oh yeah, like the devil's out there and he's bad and he's trying to make my life hard. And no, what Paul's saying is we, people are not your problem. I will say that again. People are not your problem. But there's a very real spiritual reality where there are demonic forces over regions, influencing people, influencing governmental structures, all this stuff, that's at play. And that's real. Moving into a second part, we see throughout scripture that there is a call to unity and a call to maintain unity. That seems like, okay, Aaron, that's kind of obvious. Why do you bring that up? I bring that up because, and this is where my Fancy Bible education comes into play. You get this part for free. You're welcome. Um, the New Testament, all of the books in the New Testament are occasional. And what that means is that there was a reason for them being written. Paul wasn't just sitting in prison going, you know what? I think I'll write Romans today. You know what? I think I'll write Ephesians today. I haven't, I haven't caught up with the church at Ephesus for a while. I'm just going to say some stuff I've got on my mind. He was very aware, and the New Testament writers were very aware of the struggles that were going on at churches in these different regions. So if the call to unity is prevalent throughout all of those, 
then that means that the church has historically and consistently had a trouble with unity. Now let's pair these two things together. If people are not your problem, and there's real demonic spiritual forces at play, and the church has consistently struggled with unity, struggled with infighting, struggled with division, again, what we would call political spirit, then I would propose to you that the idea that there is a real demonic spiritual force whose assignment is to sow discord and disunity in the body of Christ, I would propose to you that that's not a big logical leap. Okay? Are we tracking? We making sense? Okay. (laughs) Got to get coffee to get ready for round two. Okay. So I want to frame our talk today, uh, again, in the context of the word that God gave me for the year, where there's a yoke of bondage that I would call the political spirit or the divisive spirit. But then there's a yoke of Jesus, where there's mutual submission and submission to Jesus and submission to each other. So when I jump into this part where I'm going to talk about the political spirit, it might seem very disjointed, but I want to give you guys kind of a picture of what I'm doing. A lot of times in sermons, we're used to a very line upon line, this thing equals the next thing equals the next thing equals my main point. What I'm doing is saying, okay, if we can agree that there's a political or divisive spirit at work at large, I'm going to hold that up and I'm going to try to show you different facets of that thing. So I'll be going and making a bunch of little points that I think are potent, I think are real. I spend a lot of time in prayer around these, a lot of time in scripture around these. But I just want to give you some context for how I'm going about it because you're like, well, you were talking about this thing and you jumped over here. Again, I'm holding something up. I'm saying, let's look at this from a bunch of different angles. I'm also hoping to hold a mirror up to our own hearts. Because what we're very prone to do as human beings is when somebody brings up something that could lead to conviction, we're very prone to saying, everybody else but me. And I'll actually start off by saying that's one of the things that the political or the divisive spirit does. Everybody else is the problem. I'm not the problem. I'm going to read a chunk of scripture from Galatians uh, 5, 19 through 21. Um, I'm going to read the whole thing because I have a point that I want to make here. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft— Hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, and he goes on. And I'm warning you about these things. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We would agree that our culture is pretty divisive, right? The main way we relate to each other is by, you know, what do you think about XYZ issue? And then I'll choose to be in relationship with you based on what you think about that issue. We would call that divisiveness. We would call that factions. I want to point out to you that dissensions and factions are in the same list alongside sexual immorality, promiscuity, idolatry, and witchcraft. That should shock you a little bit. So the political spirit, and when I'm talking about the divisiveness here, this is more than just, you know, I don't know, we don't agree about certain issues, we don't vote for the same political party, I don't know. The divisions that we make against each other out of that, Scripture puts in the same category as sexual immorality. We are very, very good in the church about talking about sexual promiscuity and how bad it is and, you know, how awful pornography is. We're very prone to writing people off based off of the political party they vote for. I'll let that one sit there. One of the things the political spirit will do is have you believing that you know everything you need to know about another person based off of small bits of information. Like whether or not they voted Republican or Democrat in the last election. Now I want to jump in here and say that I'm not saying that this is an incredibly simple thing. And what I'm not saying is that there's not room or need for real discussion based off of some of these issues. Because I know I'm jumping in the middle of a huge topic right now. 
But I want to paint a picture for you really quick of how the early church actually handled division around things. So in the early church, when there started to be division, where there started to be, you know, different doctrines that would come out, people were denying the divinity of Jesus. They were denying the reality of the Trinity. In today's culture, we'd say, eh, you think something I don't agree with? Cool. You go start your own thing. I'll just separate off from you. In the early church, we spent hundreds, I will say this again, hundreds of years in dialogue with each other. And when a decision finally got made, leaders from all the churches from all over the world, from within Rome, the Mediterranean, Africa, came together. So we're talking weeks worth of trips to come together to begin to make a decision on something that they would then call heresy. We are prone to hearing something that makes us uncomfortable and writing them off as a heretic. One is based in family, in unity, and preserving the body. The other is based in, I don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation with you, so I'm going to write you off and ship you out. (laughs) Selah. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll point this out to the word factions up here is the Greek word hieresis, which is actually where we get the word heresy. So we're prone to using that word when somebody uses a theological position we don't like. Nine times out of ten, it's not actually even a theological position that uh, the church has historically divided over. But we're prone to using that word as like, oh, you're a Calvinist? Or you're not a Calvinist? Ugh, heretic. I would propose to you that when we're engaging in the political spirit, in the divisive spirit, Another way to put that is when we're drawing lines that Jesus isn't drawing. When we're drawing lines that Jesus isn't drawing, we're engaging in heresy. Okay? Another point to make, another facet. The political spirit makes ourselves and our opinions the central thing that we unify around as opposed to Jesus himself. The core is pride and the need to be right. The Lord uh, confronted me on this pretty clearly when I was in the middle of working on my Bible and theology degree. I was coming out of one of my classes, and he just spoke very simply to my heart. He said, Aaron, if you study so that you can be right, that's all you'll get. If you study to know me, you'll get everything. Because here's the other part of this. What the political spirit will begin to prey on, the divisive spirit will begin to prey on, is when our identity is not actually grounded in the sacrifice and the love of Jesus. So now when we don't have that security, we go, okay, well, how do I know that I'm in right standing? And oftentimes, because human nature is to swing between extremes, when we're in that level of insecurity, we jump into, how do I know that I'm right? By making sure that everybody else is wrong. So when we study, when we learn, when we read scripture, it's oftentimes not from a place of, I want to know God. It's, I want to be the most right person in any room so that I know that I'm okay. And that's where the divisive spirit gets in. Because now all of a sudden the thing that we're supposed to be unifying around scripture, Jesus himself, we use him essentially as a battering ram to push other people aside when they don't line up with our interpretation. And we'll say to something that we have working against us here, um, this isn't to make a value judgment, this is just something to point out. Being Protestant, part of our movement says when we don't agree with people, we create another denomination. Again, there's a lot of historical stuff into that. I'm not trying to open up that whole can of worms, but I am pointing something out. Part of our faith history says that when we don't agree on something, we just say like, cool, I'll separate off, go start my own thing. Leads to a situation right now where we have 30,000 Protestant denominations. That was (laughs) 30,000.
the counterpoint to this is Jesus drew all men unto himself, not by his rightness, but by his sacrifice. John 3, 13 through 14 talks about how when Moses, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness in Israel's history, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So the saving work, the unifying work of Jesus was not actually found in him coming to earth and saying, this is how right I am and how wrong you are. It's saying, I'm going to use how right I am and how good I am with the Father. I'm going to use that as a stepping stone and not a dividing wall. I'm going to use my relationship with the Father to go low and to sacrifice. And it's from that place of sacrifice that we invite people into the presence of Jesus. Here's where this thing can actually get a little bit even more insidious. When we're inside of this divisive spirit, this divisive way of thinking, we'll think that the way to love other people is to tell them how wrong they are. I'm just sharing the truth in love. Judging by the nervous laughter, we've heard that one a few times. <laughs> Jesus spent a good chunk of his time with prostitutes, with tax collectors, people who were cheating their countrymen out of money, liars, thieves, cheats, prostitutes. I have a hard time imagining that Jesus... His, the first thing out of his mouth was, let me tell you how wrong you are so that we can hang out. I just need you to know how wrong you are on so many different things. And then once I know that you know that, then I can spend time with you. Doesn't seem to be the way it happened. Just hit a few more points really quickly because I know I'm running short on time here. The breeding ground for the political spirit is over familiarity with God. What do I mean by that? There comes a point in your there can come a point in your relationship with the Lord where you get bored with him, where you get over familiar with him to the point where you believe you know his thoughts on something without needing to ask him. The moment you step into that, you put yourself in a position where you now have to defend that thing constantly. And that's when you start laying the ax to the root of a bunch of different relationships. Because now all of a sudden, w the trap that we've bought into is if I'm engaging with the world through that spot of, I know God so well, I don't need to ask him, this is what he thinks about everything. Then the moment somebody brings a contrary opinion, a contrary thought, you're not interpreting that through the lens of maybe I was wrong. You're interpreting that through the lens of if I'm wrong on this, I don't know God. Which is why we get so hostile. Because we've conflated our need to be right and our need to know everything with what it means to actually know God. And they're actually very different. What do I mean by that? Another practical picture that actually... Somebody shared this with me, and it really changed the way I looked at uh, theology and just studying and knowing God in general. He said, when you get to heaven, when you see God in all of his glory, when you see what John talks about in Revelation 4, lightning, thunder, angels circling around him, worship going on, do you think you're going to look at that man and say, yep, got it all right? I nailed that. I couldn't have been any more correct on who this guy is and how this all worked out. Man, I am, I am just so right on. Okay, so if that's the case, and if we're going to need to acknowledge that when we see him, we're going to realize we were wrong on a lot of stuff, Maybe we should be engaging with people, with ourselves, with a little bit more humility. Got a bunch of more points, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to just end in what not to do. I want to end this with uh, giving a picture of what Jesus is actually inviting us into. A bunch of these are in Ephesians. I'll just give some highlights really quickly. Um, for slides, this is uh, the yoke of Jesus, which is submission to Jesus and submission to each other. 
Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Paul's writing and he says, uh, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. What's interesting here is that submission to Jesus, Paul equates that with submitting to one another. In, in the context of American individualism, that's what made all of us feel so uncomfortable when I just said that. Part of submitting to Jesus looks like submitting our lives to each other. Another way to put that in more practical, real sense, that's what family looks like. Me living in the context of a family means I might have all these different things I want to do, all this time I want to spend with my friends, but I'm aware that I have a wife and I'm aware that I have children. So I have to submit those things to them, which means there's a lot of stuff I might not get to do. And it also speaks to the humility that God wants us to have with each other and that that's actually where unity starts and what unity looks like. I have my opinions. I have my thoughts. I have things that I want and even need from you but I'm submitting that to you even as other people are submitting themselves to yourself. That's the beginning of what unity looks like. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. We're familiar with this passage, but there's something I want to highlight. He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead, seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler, authority, power, and dominion. Again, that's the stuff we were talking about from Ephesians 6. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him, Jesus, as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Part of the plan of God for unifying everything was to unify everything under Jesus. So what are we doing making everything but Jesus the thing we divide over? I'm not saying that, we, that there aren't reasons to divide. I'm not saying that there aren't real conversations that need to be had. What I am saying is most of the time we're missing the mark because we'd rather write people off than have uncomfortable conversations. When you engage with the political spirit, the divisive spirit, you get a faction. God's wanting to set up a family. When you engage with the political spirit, you get a faction, meaning a group of people that identify themselves based off of we think this, this, and this about these issues. God's setting up a family. What's the difference there? Within a faction, engagement and agreement only goes so far as we think the same about these different things. The moment somebody differs, you cut them off. Within a family, there's something stronger than that called covenant binding you together. Covenant set is two people coming together, and I want to split something up for you. A covenant is not a contract. It's deeper than that. When a, when a contract happens, the moment somebody breaks that contract, the whole thing's off. Within a covenant, that's two people coming together to say, or two parties coming together to say, regardless of how you show up, I'm going to show up. And that right there, that is what actually gives us the safety to have hard conversations. Because I know that regardless of how much it makes me uncomfortable and how much it makes you uncomfortable, I know that you're not going to leave just because I'm having the conversation with you. Another point to bring up, how many people in your church family do you feel like your relationship with them aligns with what I just said. How many of us have switched churches without having a conversation, but because somebody said something from the pulpit we didn't like and it ended at that? What I'm not saying is that God can't call you to different congregations. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying don't let a divisive spirit be the reason you're leaving. You can all stand.
You can just close your eyes, put yourself in a posture to receive. I'll lead us through praying something here in a minute. Um, there's one last point I want to make here. And it's that the political spirit will actually cut you off from experiencing the fullness of what God wants you to experience. I had a, bu- I had a big issue in my life where I, uh, I actually would sort of came up in the faith, Baptist, cessationist, so the prophetic healing, things like that didn't happen. Um, and as, after I came out of that into what we would call more of a charismatic stream, I very much let my heart get caught up in the divisive spirit because like anything remotely anti-charismatic, remotely anti-gifts, I would instantly shut my heart off to that. But here's something that I had to realize. My knowledge of scripture came from the cessationist Baptist school that I went through K K through 12. Engaging in the political spirit will actually cut you off from the fullness of the body and from the fullness of what God wants you to engage in. Here's one more thing and then I'll have us pray. The political spirit will have you believing that the next move of God looks like you, sounds like you, and thinks like you. Anybody know how Azusa Street happened? Through a one-eyed, uneducated, African-American son of a slave that everybody wrote off. And that's what ignited the Pentecostal movement that we in many ways are a result of. And a lot of people wrote that whole thing off because the guy who was leading it was what I just described. The political spirit cut people off from experiencing what God wanted to do in that hour. So I'm just gonna lead us through some prayer here. Um, You can put your hand on your heart. I'm just gonna pray, pray us through breaking agreement with this thing. Um, again, I'm sure there's different levels of engagement with that around the room, but if you want to just repeat after me, say, Holy Spirit, I repent for how I've engaged with the political spirit. I repent of the lie that I can only be safe with people who think like me, act like me, and look like me. I repent for where I've sowed division. I want to be a unifier. Holy Spirit, convict me. Show me where I've said yes to this. Show me where I've said yes to this in my family, in my friendships in my relationships. We break agreement with this now. In Jesus' name.